Hello, Simple Plastic Castle listener. Welcome to another show. Now we're going to be answering a very common question. Should I be doing a 1031 exchanging my uh, property for another property? Quick announcements. Uh, we are going to be doing the 2022 Mastermind Retreat. Open to past investors, family office members, and select new WE members out there. Now to learn more, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash 2022 retreat. This is going to be January 14th through the 17th. We have a pretty packed week, a lot of happy hours, a lot of time for you guys to get together, meet at the bar over a meal, over a long day at masterminding, especially on Sunday, which is the workshop day and fun stuff like hiking. We'll definitely be doing a luau, but really getting the group of mostly accredited investors around the table and interacting and building those organic relationships, which is critical to being a passive investor, finding where to invest, where to stay away from, tax, legal, infinite banking, and a lot of those more softer conversations about legacy planning, building your family office. A lot of those are the conversations that's going to be coming out in Hawaii for those who come again. Check out the website, simplepassivecashflow.com slash 2022 retreat. See you there. Now, what I've been up to this past month, I've been freaked out with Biden changing the regulations on the estate taxes. Now I've been looking at ways to get money out of my own personal estate by doing an irrevocable trip. Now there are a couple ones that I'm looking at either it's called the high set, either have your cake and eat it too, or just bite it. Now I'm not an attorney. And I'm still learning this stuff, but this is the thing with high net worth investors is first to go talk it out with other people. Of course, you have your estate attorney helping you along the way, but a lot of these ideas you need to work out with other people in your similar net worth range, uh, mostly accredited investors, of course, discuss what is going to be the best fit for you. A lot of this stuff can be very expensive, but sometimes it's just finding the loopholes in the system. It's just what the wealthy cool idea that I heard lately was making a buy it where you're making an irreparable trust, putting all your investments in it and creating that trust into a pseudo real estate professional status. And for some of you super smart people out there who understand that once you're real estate professional status, sure. You're going to have your passive losses offset your ordinary income by doing a few things on your taxes, of course. But what's really going on is when you're real professional staff, all your passive income, passive losses is ordinary income, ordinary losses. So follow me on this. If you have your buy trust, a real estate professional status, therefore shouldn't all the income and the passive losses coming from it be ordinary income, and ordinary losses, get your head scratching there. Come on over to Hawaii. We'll have that great conversation with amongst other financial fanatic friend out in Hawaii. And I will talk about brainstorming ideas like this so we can take it to our tax and estate attorneys, professionals to put in implement. Because to me, the best practices come from folks just like ourselves and then be educated and take these ideas uh, and then put them into reality with the right professionals. But again, thanks you guys for listening and hope to see you in Honolulu, Hawaii, January 14th to the 17th and enjoy the show. This is a story about a dude named Lane. Then one day he went and tried to rent them out, and then he became one of the man. You guys are jumping into a live coaching call here, and this question comes up quite uh, frequently. As most people out there are running around thinking about these 1031 exchanges, which I don't know why anybody does this stuff, because you're at this 45 day rule where you have to identify properties and I don't know who the heck can find a good deal in 45 days unless they blindly trust the real estate agent and they just go into lukewarm crappy deals. But anyway, we love 1031 buyers because and sellers because they're desperate and we know we can sell it for a stupid price to them because they're desperate. But anyway, we have our friend Steve Fama here from the state of Washington going to be talking about their situation and we're going to walk through the pros and cons and how it works for tax. As I preface all this stuff here, I'm not a CPA, not a lawyer, but hey, this is what I did with all my properties in 2017 when I sold, I think seven or eight of my turnkey rentals. I had a capital gain 
and I had a depreciation recapture. And we're going to go to these numbers in this example of $200,000, but I had been going into syndication deals that did cost segregation. I had maybe a few hundred thousand or maybe even more of passive losses. So I just brought over $200,000 to suspended passive losses, offset the gain. And now I was able to diversify instead of being like trapped into one or two deals, which is breaks the cardinal sin of mine. Never go into a deal with more than five or ten percent of your net worth, depending on what your network is. But uh, hey, Steve, are you there? And I'm here. Really appreciate it. And we'll get into the whole analogy with the hot air balloon in case you still want to go down this route to at the end. But why don't you give us some round numbers on what like the situation you're in? So you, you bought this. You're going to sell this property. What did you buy it for? And what do you think you can sell it? Sure. So I bought a couple properties. And since I'm Steve Ballmer, let's say that I, I bought them for about uh, $1.7 billion, sold them for $2.5 billion. Okay. And, Is uh, this really $1.7 million? Or let's, can we go with that? Yeah. One point? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so what'd you say? 2.5 minus 1.7 is the capital gain? Yeah, plus... Oh, sorry, what was it again? 2.5 minus 1.7. So we're yep. talking about a capital gain of 800 grand. Yep. Now, there were some sales costs, of course. But there's also about uh, 200,000 of depreciation that I've claimed. Cool. So we have to add on top of that 0.2 million. And so that puts us up to... One million dollars. It might be a little bit less than this because all the commissions and stuff like that, you're going to have to that can de be deducted too. But let's just go with million dollars because this is a great round example. And so let's not try and create any brain damage for ourselves during this recording. So we have a million dollars of depreciation recapture and capital gain that we have to offset. Which, on the one hand, is a good job there, Steve. But how are we going to offset this so that it's not a huge capital gain? Most people, a million dollars is a lot of money to offset. Most people are looking at maybe a hundred to a few hundred thousand dollars of capital gain. And that's what I was, but are these like kind of the true numbers? Are you really looking at a capital gain depreciation recapture of a million dollars or is it really less? It's, I haven't run the, them by a CPA. You don't need a CPA. This is, this yeah. ain't rocket science here. Yeah. So it's actually what it was it actually is 200,000 of depreciation and it was 790 of capital gains okay so let's just uh, call it a million yeah and i've got one i've got 170 in deferred passive losses okay so that's on what your 8285 form exactly i looked okay. that up earlier yeah so for you those of you guys listening what that form is steve has accumulated passive losses from from previous years that he wasn't able to use. So they stay on his books as suspended passive losses and they're buried deep within this, what was it, the 8285 form? Is that the right one? Um, yeah, yeah. That, so, that sounds right. Yeah, so most likely your CP will not give this to you because they wanna know when you're trying to shop around it. But you're entitled to this as a client and you wanna know what this is as an investor. If you dump out that bucket, you're looking at what, you had what, 200 grand in, of 80? On your eighty to eighty five, the suspended passive losses said. I said one seventy, but we can be round. Yeah, let's go round and let's just call it two hundred. So that brings you down to you got to fill the gap of eight hundred grand. Not impossible. And is is this is just one property, right? There's another. Yeah, there were two properties that sold as one part of one deal separately. Okay. Okay. Anything, if you wanted to offset this via cost segregation by going into syndication deals. Of course, this is the big disclaimer. Every deal is different, right? Different co varying um, amounts of cost segregation or deals, very, you know, different ages of properties, different geographic locations, many factors. But for the most part, I see like in multifamily value add, class B, class C. I see whatever investors put in, assuming that there's prudent leverage, 80, 70% of the value. Maybe you see 50% to 80% of what you put in this first year losses i've seen it come back over 100 percent too I'll just run with 60 percent just to be conservative oh wow yeah that was one of the big numbers that i was wondering if i bought into a, a syndication that did cost segregation with x dollars what percent of x might i get back 
So it, I mean, in theory, you could go invest like 1.2, 1.4 million and knock this 800 out, right? But I wouldn't suggest that. That's a little ballsy to just go. And, <laughs> well, and well, you did call me ball. I guess so. And you're a high roller there. I was actually behind you in, in Starbucks one of these days in Bellevue back in the day before you bought the Clippers. But anyway, so yeah, like you could go on to, you could deploy that much money and do that. Not recommended. I have people in my mastermind group, they've done it because they arm themselves with the right investor group and go off of referrals and deploy very quickly. To me personally, what I see a lot of people do and what I would do is just go into a few deals at the minimum, test the relationship out. And that unfortunately, that means maybe if you do a hundred grand a few times, that's 300 grand. That's not going to get you anywhere to be $800,000 of passive losses. Maybe by investing 300, you get 200,000. Is that kind of makes sense in theory you yeah. can but let's be real here right you don't take me as i just jump into the abyss type of guy so no i've uh, never seen on any of your other coaching calls you give that advice to anyone yeah but so like one other thing have you sold this subject property yet yeah it's sold at this point all oh. of yeah so you're gonna love this one all the proceeds are sitting in qi accounts as part of a 1031 exchange uh, and these 1031 guys drive me insane because like a lot of these things like all these self-directed retirement accounts these other solo 401k accounts that people tout as all these snake oil type of products they're all they're good they're good in the right situation they're all tools same thing with 1031 exchanges in the right situation they make sense one so you sold you have until the end of the year to accumulate $800,000 of passive losses. <laughs> yep, that's the challenge. So you're a little, like, so, okay, this is just for the viewers, right? I don't want you to get down on yourself. But if you would have done it like the way I would have preferred, it was like, all right, let's wait until like January, February of 2022. And that way we have all of the remaining of this year and next year to build up 800 grand of passive activity losses. How do you time that kind of a sale? So it turns out that it was actually in about January that I went to my real estate agent and said, hey, I'd love to talk about what these would be valued with. And by the time that conversation resolved and a uh, buyer was found and three or four months dragged out, we got to June before closing, actually. Yeah, you haven't yeah, sold this thing, have you yet? You, you have. Yeah, I, I okay. have. Okay. So it's, I started the process in January, but it took six months to sell. Yeah. So, so you, if I were trying to time it, a sale to land in January, how would that even be possible? You, it seems like selling is- You sell at the end a, of, You sell at the end of the year right? Or you delay it, like, or you, you don't, you lead with, let's just start off getting passive activity losses as much as we can first. And then we go and sell the asset, ideally in the beginning of the following year. Okay. So you put it on the market in November, October, so that closing happens in January. Yeah. Or you just wait until middle of quarter one until you, if you wanted to do this the smart way you don't do this until you're like right at the end of your quest for eight hundred thousand dollars of passive victory losses so you actually so you know what it might sell for and then you build up the passive losses ahead of time yeah it's not a oh, guessing right. game right you don't need cpa to do that you and i just did that right here maybe it'll come plus or minus 50 grand but go get close to eight hundred thousand dollars and Let's then let's get our calculator. But it's all water in the bridge now, right now. Let's not worry about it. But in case this happens again, you don't have mm -hmm. another one of these types of properties, do you? You just got everything locked nope, up. I had all my real estate portfolio in those two properties. Yeah. And and this is so this is the analogy why I don't like these 1031 exchanges and I don't like the strategy of putting all your eggs in one basket like how you have. Obviously, the obvious thing is like you don't want you want to diversify, which is why my rule for five to ten percent at most of your net worth into any one asset because things happen. See, locations change. Um, they could find a nuclear bomb in Tacoma or whatever, Pasco. Who knows, right? Things happen. This is why I'd like to diversify over a few major markets and stay away from a complete tertiary market portfolio. But nevertheless, it's like the analogy I use is like a hot air balloon. So maybe five, 10 years ago, you, you got it. You bought the asset, you bought the beginning assets that started this and the hot air balloon goes up and up. Maybe when you had a, a hundred, few hundred thousand dollars of capital gain, the hot air balloon is like eight feet up in the ground. You know, you could probably jump out and you'd be okay. <laughs> the, yeah. the real Steve Ballmer probably twist an ankle. Pretty energetic guy. 
Yeah. And that's what I did. Like when I sold my seven rentals that I had a $200,000 capital gain depreciatory capture. So maybe I was 10 feet up in the air. Mm -hmm. But by having all these past suspended passive losses built up on my 8285 form, it was like I took a bunch of pillows in the ground. I had three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand dollars of passive fee losses of pillows. Then when I jumped out ten feet out of the, a hot air balloon, I just landed on a bunch of pillows, and I'm cool. In this case, you <laughs> rolled that hot air balloon up. I don't know what you want to call it, like seventy feet up in the nah. I don't know, forty feet up there. It's gonna and hurt. I, it's gonna hurt, but you you're probably gonna live. And and this is why I like this analogy. Okay, here's what I really suggest real time for your look. I'm not a big fan of like hastily investing, but you got to get going, right? You're going to get some damn pillows under you because if you fall out of this potter and balloon at 40 feet up in the air, there's a good chance you're going to die. We know for a fact you're going to pay a boatload of those taxes on the $800,000 capital gain. Most likely 50 cents on every dollar that you don't put to protect yourself when you fall out. So mm-hmm. for the next six months, you need to be running out there and at least trying to go into deals with get, get a lot of a deep cost segregations that get bonus depreciation to save you 50 cents in every dollar. Uh, we know for a fact you're going to pay for that. Obviously, don't go into bad deals with bad people. In a way, it makes sense. This is why a lot of my guys will use like conservation easements. It's another more exotic thing that you might want to consider in the situation because you're screwed. There's a lot of scrutiny over conservation easements when you google it you'll get red flagged all over the place a lot of my guys do this a lot of my doctors they do this kind of every year they make seven hundred thousand dollars and they bring their agi down to 400 to save you know they spend money but to get that tax and it's like they spend a dollar to make four dollars in a way and that's what you might have to do here you may have to take an extra chance to save money on taxes which you know is going to evaporate or you could but Might it makes sense to, to focus on or, or to go look for development deals or something that would have a higher loss up front. I don't know if development has a loss up, higher good, loss up front. Good question. So you cannot take depreciation until your asset makes a dollar. Mm-hmm. So if you're talking ground up development, you can't take the depreciation from that until that thing, thing gets built and making money. So that's typically... That might put you in 2022, 2023. Or higher value ad plays. If there's like, it's currently break even, but there's 60% occupancy and they've got to do a major reno to convert a motel into apartments. At the end of the day, essentially what you're discussing about is like basically stretching your dollar and getting more leverage on it Mm -hmm. by going into these crappier, more distressed deals. Which, it, it, in theory, it works. So to answer your question, yes. Another option might be the opportunity zone funds type of deals. But the problem, and they're both good ways of mitigating the tax, but personally, I wouldn't do either. Harry deals, I don't want to go into Harry deals, especially if you're an accredited investor already. Like You want capital preservation. You want to be going into good deals in solid locations. And opportunity funds, the reason why the government gives you such a perk there is because it's in a really crappy area. <laughs> so you have to ask yourself, I see, I had another guy in my group, he, he sold a franchise and he had a boatload of past of, of capital gains. We're talking like millions. So he's desperate. This dude was like looking, instead of you looking 40 feet down, this guy's looking 200 feet down on their hotter. He's screwed. He's going to die. He jumps out. So he was looking for yeah. all kinds of things. And I, I advise him, don't do the opportunity zone fund thing because you're not an operator you you haven't really owned properties out of state for goodness sake i think you mr steve bomber based on your experience you said i think you have the aptitude to do that but this particular guy had no like real estate operation experience so that's why i was so strongly against it now a year and a half later the person's like, yeah i your this is the pain in the butt there's a reason why so the lesson learned is don't let the tax tail wag the dog but what is what do you think of that is th- are, those are options right yeah no it sounds like i gotta sit down and do some math and decide whether like maybe you break a leg jumping but wait heels and you can run from there versus if there's some amount of risk to to take up i guess another question would be since these are in 1031 since the proceeds are currently in 1031 accounts if i can find 1031 deals if I could like for a third or half that money, then I'm only talking about 
half the amount of capital gains that I have to pay taxes on. And going back to the analogy, this is you're 40 feet up in the air. Let's just throw 20 feet of pillows in there or 10 feet of pillows. It's better than nothing. So I could be a little bit of a distressed buyer and a little bit of a smart investor. And then next time I roll things over, try to be smart about how I do that one. Or you just get out of that stuff all freaking together, right? Yeah. And, And so I guess the question is how much pillows to throw under versus how much pain to take now. Yeah. If you want to take a blended approach, maybe you like you you try and go into a few hundred thousand dollars of syndicated deals and you get like a couple hundred grand of passive activity losses there. You already you already doing a ten thirty one. Maybe you do a ten thirty one, but you ten thirty one to a smaller property and maybe you do some opportunity zone and some distress stuff. But to, if it were me, I would do the like land conservation easements and take the gamble there, the tax gamble on the audit with that stuff and also okay. try and do as much syndications as possible. Yeah, that makes sense. Plus but, I, I love running around outside. So land conservation easement sounds like something that would support that community. There you go. There you go. It can feed the duck. Of course, I will say, right, this is reported in 2021. There's a lot of scrutiny around this. There are some fee simple types of arrangements where there's supposedly less audits, but we go into this very in detail with my mastermind people along with the right people to work with, which is the most important thing. If somebody is just listening to this on the YouTube channel and not paying any, that's where the danger comes in when you just blindly start to jump into these type of things. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe here's what I would do a little bit about your situation, Steve. What I would do is try and go into a few deals before the end of the year, try and put maybe you get a couple hundred thousand dollars of passive losses. And then if you find a good property in the next, is your 45 day period over? Or? No, I've got about 20 more days. You're screwed, man. That's what we like. Yeah. But if you, let's just say you find something or maybe you find something and you're like, dang it, like this thing sucks, but whatever. I'd rather go into a crappy investment than paying the government, which some people believe believe maybe you shelter a little bit there and, and maybe you throw in 50 grand into a land conservation easement to get that 5x multiplier to get two hundred fifty thousand dollars of, of losses and you break it up a third or worse comes to worse maybe you don't get that property in the middle and you don't do a 1031 exchange and you just suck it up 50 percent on three hundred thousand dollars hundred fifty thousand dollar tax bill it's not the end of the world right Lesson. Yeah, that's, I think yeah, that's I, how I, think, I would do it. I think I'm seeing a lot of the, the mom and pop mistakes come out here. I, I will just discuss. People say, oh, can you 1031 into a syndication? The lawyers will always say, yeah, you can, but they'll never give you the details. And the details is you can go into a deal with what's called a tenant in common, but it's nobody does it because it's super complicated and it's a real pain in the butt. No syndicator in their right mind who is not desperate for your money will let you in for less than like a million or two million bucks. Okay, so that's interesting because my real estate agent that I've worked with is setting up a fund and he's accepting tenant in common to partner alongside the fund. Uh, is the just the fact that he's accepting tenant in common like a little bit of a red flag? How many is deals have you done? With him? Oh, me? Or him. Yeah, what's his tracker versus experience? Yeah, so he's been in real estate for about the last 10 years. Well, every that doesn't mean anything, right? Like, oh, so I know of two or three other large properties that he's acquired and one that he's closed. As far as I know, this is one of his larger renovation deals. And he's also offering this on a less of a renovation, more of just buying below market deal in a flyover state yeah it's a wild ass yeah. plan with a really good dumb money investor such as yourself okay. that's, that's, that's what it really is like. but let's just say it's a good deal right let's just say right. it's i'm mean, actually looking at a 10 unit in bill ballard right now that actually is a good deal you found a unit in ballard that's a good deal yeah 10 10 unit because seattle is actually a little distressed at the moment right now but anyway <laughs> let's just say it is a good deal and you make a, bun- a bunch of money but you're going to be in the same dang predicament when you sell. And this is where it's stop doing the crazy and get off of this stuff. Uh-huh. You say you want to move to the more passive thing anyway. And like all these burrs and flips, it's all ordinary income. You want to get away from that stuff. That's like going out at partying at 2 a.m. in the morning, every Friday and Saturday, you want to get away from that stuff. It's tiring. It's 
not tax efficient. That's exactly why I'm looking to get into syndications. I was tired of being liable for loans and insurance, especially when the property manager sometimes didn't pay taxes or the post service slowed down. And, <laughs> and so the property manager that was still using mail and not direct deposit was late to the bank. So yeah, I, I would love to get into some of these syndications exactly because I'm looking to be passive. Yeah. But I guess um, to round out this example, Steve, is there any, did, did the, that kind of capture everything for you? Is play at all scenarios or anything you'll want to talk through on this tender? Um, thing? Yeah, I think I've been looking for someone to give me a straight answer about how difficult this is going to be to deal with the tax situation. And because the, the real estate agent that I was talking to was, oh, just 1031 it. And the 1031 guys just send me the property, replacement property. Here's some ideas. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is why I'm, I fight so hard for you guys, because it's like sophisticated investors don't do that type of stuff. The people that do the 1031 exchanges to me are like the really dumb money that like trust fund kids who like inherit all this money, which I know in your case is not the case. You actually did a good value to the property and it went up in the right place. But like normally it's like big families that they pass down a 40 unit or big assets to mm -hmm. their kids paid all paid off. And so I guess the closing question is because my real estate experience has just been through this one agent, pretty much he's deals he's found in the past have doubled twice over the past 10 years. So I've made plenty of money with him. And I've got one friend who's also in real estate. I just don't have much of a network. Uh, I found you because I was two, three weeks ago when all of a sudden I had money in 45 days to do something with it. I started going through podcasts and you were in, interviewed on one of those podcasts. How do you build an app? So, how, do you, how do you find deal flow? What do I do? So you make a podcast and start it in 2016 where you help people get turnkeys and people think you're a legit person and they attract them and you have two or three calls with guys like yourself every day. But that's not practical advice because every jabroni makes a podcast these days and it becomes very disingenuous, I think. But I, the only advice I have is don't go to the local RIA. And I know where you're at, Steve. All these ones are just for broke guys or flipping house flippers and sharks and wholesalers. It's not your crowd. It's not the million dollar accredited investor. It's not the guy for the guys making over 80 grand a year. I was in this case back in 2012 and I felt super out of place. And that's why I went to out of state turnkeys back in 2012. Um, yeah, 2012. And it's, I think this is the point where you got to play to pay to play. And this is where like in 2015, I had 11 rentals and it, I didn't start to get into the big stuff. And so I started to get into these higher level groups and often you have to pay or travel to go and find these other pure passive accredited investors. But sorry for the, I'm not really giving you any advice here, right? Maybe the only other thing is some people say, well, go to places where rich people hang, like the country club or the cigar room. But unfortunately, a lot of those people are just like high paid, like corporate guys or trust fund kids, second generation, third generation wealth, who just invest a little bit differently than folks like you and me, who are the people that made their first million dollar in their family. I guess the closing question then is going through your website, there's lots of, it seems like there's lots of opportunities and educational offerings and meetup things. What's the difference between a mastermind and a mastermind family office? And it seems like you mentioned potentially doing something in Portland. What are those the same? Are they different? I'm a little confused about what all of the networking opportunities related to simple passive cash flow are. Yeah, good question. And it's changed over the years and then probably haven't like updated the website at all. But <laughs> we first, when I first started to do this thing back in 2016, like it was cool just to meet investors, but then simple passive cash flow became a thing. We have over 600 investors that have actually thrown in at least 50, a hundred grand into deals thus. And it has been a huge target on our backs that we are a legit investor group with people who would love to infiltrate the group. And we've had people in the past. So all the little fun, free things that happy hours, I've cut that out. And at this point, it's only people that have invested in past deals or in the family office mastermind group. So you got to put up some money to invest to be in be invited in a way because I protect the identity and privacy of my group and the members for their own purpose. And I don't want a bunch of douchebags coming in and just raiding email addresses and phone numbers. 
I'll be honest. Cool. I'm sure everyone appreciates that. I'll have to follow up on how to get in. Yeah, but that's why we do these calls. You get to know each other, build relationships, and just see what I can do to help out and see where you're at and see if you're a good fit. I kind of, I see my role as being just that good steward at the gatekeep, bringing in the right people, filtering the right people, especially for mindset, right? There's some people that are super cheap out there that are just a little weird and, and they just don't give back to others and they don't, they're not just good community members. Maybe they'll get there at some point, but yeah, that's what I wanted because we joke and laugh about this in all our calls, our mastermind group calls is who the heck do we talk about this stuff? Our parents don't do it. Our coworkers think we can't tell our coworkers that we're going to pull 50 grand from our 401k friends and family. Like I don't talk to this stuff about my friends either. I, I've always joked that I've said Thanksgiving is the, one of the loneliest times because <laughs> everybody thinks that I'm like a real estate agent or they just don't understand. Nobody understands me, but you guys understand me and figuring out these little hacks for financial freedom, the tax, the legal, infinite banking. That's where it gets all pulled together. Yeah, it's like a club for financial fanatics, but... Yeah, I think that addresses most of the curiosities I had at the start of the call. I appreciate the honest feedback. Yeah, and I think thanks for breaking down the 1031 exchange thing, because I think this is a good call where we finally talk all <laughs> options. And But this yeah. is a very common question, right? Comes up. Cool. cool. I appreciate your time. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.